Evidence by Murray Linster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Evidence by Murray Linster. It was hot. My pony jogged listlessly along without interest or animation, while I was only concerned with the problem of getting to shade and water, but especially shade. The sun was hot enough to fry anyone's brains in his skull, and my saddle burned my hand if I touched it where the sun struck it. There was a trickling stream of perspiration down either cheek and a third stream down my nose. From time to time I smudged the dust across my face in an attempt to stop the streams, but the action merely interrupted their course. It was in this peculiarly Texan atmosphere that I came upon Jimmy Calton. He was standing by the open hood of one of those mechanical miracles known as a tin lizzie, holding a sooted spark plug and a cloth in one hand and attempting to clean it with the other. He was swearing the while dispassionately in a curious mingling of good Anglo-Saxon and Dobie Spanish. Hello, Jimmy, I said listlessly. He looked up and nodded. Say, you look hot, he observed. Come on and ride a ways with me. Lizzie here will be running in a minute, and you can tie your pony on behind. Going anywhere in particular, I asked. Over to see the coroner, he's told me. Old Abe Martin got shot the other day, and folks are saying Harry Temple done it. They got him locked up anyways. I dismounted stiffly and tied my pony to the rear of the machine, allowing him plenty of lead rope. Jimmy finished wiping the last of the spark plugs, apostrophizing the car in the meantime. You creakin', growlin', spark plug, foulin', blasted hunk of tin, he finished lyrically, and put down the hood. He went to the crank and turned it half a dozen times. The engine caught, sputtered, and began to run with a pretentious roar. Jimmy hastily reached for the wheel and adjusted the spark and throttled and climbed in leisurely. With a grinding and a lurch we started off, my pony following docilely behind. Yes, tin, 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 said Jimmy, doing mysterious things with his feet. I have scorned you and I have flayed you, but by the guy who made you, you are better than a big car, hunk of tin. We slipped into the car's second and highest speed and began to run more smoothly. Jimmy looked behind to see that my pony was all right and began to roll a cigarette with his left hand while expertly guiding the car around the numerous ruts and rocks in the roadway. I watched the process of cigarette rolling without interest. I can't seem to get the knack of that, I remarked when he had finished and was licking the edge of the paper to hold it in place. Imitatin', said Jimmy casually. There ain't any way that everybody can do. Nobody else I know rolls em like this. It's just easiest for me. You'll have to mess around till you find a way that fits your fingers. I'll smoke tailor-made, I said, rather than bother with learning. Just like the new generation, said Jimmy severely. Jimmy, it may be said, is thirty, but affects the authority of a man of eighty. Wantin' everything done by somebody else or else by machinery. They even want the thinkin' done for em. It's too hot to think down here. I took off my hat and wiped the moisture off the sweatband. Judging by the little bit of it people do, Jimmy remarked acridly, most people agree with you. Most people look at thinking as something they was taught to do in schools and as such, something to forget as soon as possible. From the folks that don't think about the spiggity revoltosos just across the border and are pained and surprised when the spiggities run off with some of the cattle, down to the folks that would rather buy cigarettes than bother thinking up a way to roll em one-handed for themselves, everybody's just the same. Why, it wouldn't surprise me none at all if most folks told the truth just cause it's too much trouble to think up a lie. I accepted his rebuke in the matter of cigarettes meekly and said nothing. It's a fact, said Jimmy with an air of mournful pity 
for a race fallen so low. I saw in a book the other day that the best lying is the lie that's near the truth. Ain't that ridiculous? That's just justifying laziness. If folks got the goods on you and you can't get away from the truth, then it's all right to dilute the truth until it's harmless. But otherwise, a good lie beats the almost truth nine ways from Sunday. Only it's a lot of trouble thinking up a good lie and fortifying it with cumulative evidence. Jimmy rolled those two words off his tongue with some satisfaction. A cumulative evidence like a good lie ought to have. He fell silent for a while, doing marvels of steering in the avoidance of obstacles and depressions in the really horrible road. And thinking, he said suddenly, presently, folks don't like thinking. Anybody with any sense would know Harry Temple wouldn't have shot old Abe Martin. Harry Temple has got a bank account in the Farmers and Ranchers Bank, and it ain't in reason that he'd go and shoot anybody to steal their roll. Old Abe sold off six hundred steers and got the money for em. He was old-fashioned and didn't believe in banks, so he took the money home with him. And somebody went and shot him and took the roll. But Harry Temple, with a bank account at the Farmers and Ranchers Bank, it ain't reasonable that he'd go and shoot anybody for to steal their money. If he's any like I am, he's too busy wondering if somebody is going to steal his money to go stealing somebody else's. Jimmy said this last with an air of virtue that made me smile. Jimmy's much too good a poker player to be worried about his money. I know he owns one small ranch he never goes near, bought out of the proceeds of a colossal gain, still remembered along the border. But they think he did it, I asked. Show they do, Jimmy said scornfully. They's going around saying they know he did. That's Toro, of course. One of Jimmy's individualities is his habit of translating American slang into Dolby Spanish and using it in his conversation. What are you going to see the coroner for? They's holding an inquest, said Jimmy. I'm sort of going to horn in a little, I reckon. These folks are too lazy to do any thinking. If I see a chance, I'm going to do some head work for them. They is Abe Martin's place right ahead. We turned in the gate and swung up to the house. Half a dozen cars, most of them the same make as Jimmy's, clustered about the front, and there were a dozen or more ponies tethered close by the porch and dozing in the baking heat. It was quite a pretentious place built in the old-fashioned style of the days when a rancher was almost a baron in his own right. Two big barns and a huge stable behind the house almost dwarfed the dwelling proper, and quite hid it from the rear. Jimmy eased his car in among the others, snapped the switch, and alighted. Three or four of the men about the door nodded to him and told him the inquest had not started, but that it would begin shortly. Once he found that out, Jimmy plunged into an intricate and technical discussion of patented attachments for his machine, and I drifted off into the house. It was a very old house, and built with old-fashioned disregard for space. I gathered, however, that the housekeeping done in it was but sketchy. Half a dozen of his riders made it their headquarters with old Abe Martin. They bunked there and a cook prepared the meals for all of them. There was a long table with a checked red tablecloth on it. The room was empty now except for buzz and flies, where they had their meals. On the day of the shooting, I learned, the men had all been gone away on their duties, and the cook had gone into town for supplies, so Abe Martin had been alone. Presently, I went out to look at the stables. They were huge, but not much used. Three or four ponies were in their stalls, and several more stalls seemed to be used from time to time, but most of them were without signs of recent use. There had been a time when the place was the headquarters of a busy ranch, but since the time of fences the activity had lessened until only Abe Martin, his half-dozen riders, and the cook lived there. It was curious to see the dwelling place 
large in itself, dwarfed by its outbuildings. A stir in the house called me inside. The inquest was evidently to be more or less of an informal affair, but there was nonetheless a determined and businesslike air behind it all. Those men meant to get at the bottom of the matter. The coroner seemed to be a conscientious individual who took the evidence of the first witness with great exactitude, though he knew perfectly well beforehand just what the testimony would be. The whole inquiry, as a matter of fact, promised to be cut and dried in spite of Jimmy's announced intention of horning in. The first witness was the cook who had discovered the body. He had come back from town, entered the house, and discovered his employer dead on the floor of the hall. He had been shot through the heart. A writer, whom the cook had hastily summoned, corroborated his testimony and added that the body was cold when he was called, proving that death had occurred some time before. "'The evidence shows,' said the coroner casually, "'that Abe was shot when there wasn't nobody else in the house but him and the murderer. "'The cashier of the Farmers and Ranchers Bank ain't here, "'but he has give me the information that Abe had over four thousand dollars on him when he was killed. "'That's gone. "'Evidently he was shot for his money.' It's part of the duties of a coroner's jury to uncover any evidence that will help in solving the problem of who the murderer might be. Miss Joe Harkness will take the stand. There was a movement of interest in the small crowd packed into the one room. I had managed to get beside Jimmy Calton, and his face became extraordinarily mild and gentle. It hinted at some expectation of excitement, if I knew Jimmy. Everyone had heard Harkness's story before, so it was simply a recapitulation. "'I ain't got a thing to say,' announced Harkness bluntly, "'cept that I seen Harry Temple come out of this here house about three o'clock, "'just after Abe Martin was shot. "'I was having trouble with my spark plugs down the road of ways when I seen Harry. "'He come out of the kitchen door.' looked all round as if he was looking to see if anybody seen him, and then he went down toward the stables. He went inside there, then he come out of that and went over to the quarters and got a drink at the pump by the door. I was wondering what he was doing, but it looks to me like he was making sure there wasn't nobody around that could have told that he'd been around. And there's one more thing. When he come out of the house, he come out of the kitchen door, he was putting something in his breast pocket. I glanced at Jimmy Calton. He was looking at Harkness with a gentle, placid smile. His face did not change when Harry Temple stood up, pale beneath his tan. Everything Harkness says is so, said Harry Temple, determinedly. Every single word, only I didn't shoot old Abe. I come out here to see him about selling him some yearlings. He wasn't here, so I went in the kitchen to see if I couldn't leave word with the cook. The cook was missing, too, but I thought I heard somebody moving around somewhere, and I went just where Harkness said, and just in the order, he said. He must have seen me first when I come out of the kitchen. When I couldn't find nobody, I cranked up and left. Harkness stood up. I hate to contradict Harry, he said sharply, but he's made a mistake. He didn't crank up and leave. He was driving somebody else's car, and it had a self-starter on it. Harry Temple flushed slightly. That's a fact, he acknowledged. I'd forgotten that. I was driving a car they lent me at the garage. I'd left my own there to have some repairs made. Of course, said Harkness sarcastically. Nobody suspects that you was driving a strange car with strange tires so they couldn't prove nothing on you by the tracks. Jimmy put a question in a gentle voice. There's another question, he said softly. What was Harry putting in his pocket when Harkness saw him coming out of the house? I don't remember putting anything in my pocket, said Temple, beginning to be worried. It was probably my handkerchief. There was a moment's silence. One or two of the men in the room stirred uneasily. 
Jimmy Calton smiled sweetly to himself. Mr. Corner, he said slowly, may I make an observation or two? It looks like somebody ought to point out two or three facts. Go ahead, Jimmy, said the coroner. It seemed to be bothering him that so much seemed to point to the guilt of Harry Temple. Temple did seem to be quite a decent sort, and the coroner evidently hated to bring out so much to his discredit without anything to counteract the impression thus made. Knowing Jimmy, he knew Jimmy would not interfere unless he thought things were going the wrong way and that meant in this case that he had something to say in Temple's favor. Mr. Corner and gentlemen, said Jimmy formally, it don't seem hardly fair to bring out all this here evidence against a man without any evidence the other way. I want to point out two things about this here case. The first is that Harry Temple has got money in the bank, and the second is that he never disputed a single thing Harkness said about him. You know, and I know, that a man with money in the bank ain't going around doing highway robbery and murder. He can't afford to. You just think about that a while. And here's something else to think about. Did you notice that Harry Temple said right off that he'd done just what Harkness said? Now, if he'd shot old Abe Martin, you know he'd have tried to make some of that stuff sound just a little less incriminating. He'd have said he didn't go in the house just to the door and knocked, and he'd have tried to weaken everything Harkness said just that way. But he didn't. He's telling the truth so hard he can't seem to see it's putting a rope around his neck in spite of his being just as innocent as he says. As for his putting something in his breast pocket, nobody puts money there, and especially stolen money, but most everybody puts their handkerchief there. But that ain't evidence, said the coroner disappointedly. I thought you had some facts to give us. I'll give you one fact, Jimmy offered. Harry Temple didn't shoot Abe Martin. Looky here, Harkness himself don't believe he did do you? he demanded, turning to that person. Harkness sat stolidly in his chair. You heard what I said, he grunted. You heard what I seen him do. Sure I do, Jimmy admitted readily, but you know he didn't shoot Abe. Jimmy seemed to be making a fool of himself. I tugged at his sleeve for him to sit down, but he paid no attention. What do you mean? demanded Harkness, suspiciously. Nothing whatever, said Jimmy, with a gentleness I suddenly recognized as dangerous. Nothing whatever except what I said. You know Harry Temple didn't shoot Abe. You mean to tell me I'm lying, snapped Harkness angrily. No, said Jimmy, in a coo and drawl. Nothing so harmless. I'm accusing you of something a damn sight more dangerous than lying. I'm accusing you of telling the truth. The exact truth. There was a puzzled pause. I noticed, however, that Harkness was watching Jimmy with a curious alertness. It's always more dangerous to tell the truth in a case like this, Harkness, said Jimmy, still in that gentle drawl. You told the absolute truth about what you saw Harry do, and that's the most dangerous thing you could have told, cause there ain't but one man could have told that. Mr. Corner, if you look out of the window, you'll see just where Harry Temple walked down the kitchen steps, just where he went back to the stables, just where he went into the big barn, and just where he got a drink. And then, if you look, you'll see where he stopped his car, so Harkness could see that it had a self-starter on it instead of a crank. I saw a light break on the coroner's face as he looked from place to place in the yard behind the house. He faced about just as Jimmy deliberately pulled a revolver out of his pocket. Harkness told the truth, 
said Jimmy softly. He told the absolute truth. But there ain't but one place you can see all them things from. With all them bonds outside, there ain't but one place you can see the door of the stables and the big barn and the pump by the quarters and the kitchen door all at once. And there wasn't but one man in the world who could have seen Harry Temple do all of them things, cause there wasn't but one man in that place. The only place you can see all them places from is this here room, and the only man in the house when Harry Temple did them things was the man who'd shot Abe Martin and hadn't had time to get away when Harry Temple come driving in. Harkness, Jimmy's voice was suddenly like steel, if you pull that gun on me, I'll blow a hole right through the place your brains ought to be. End of Evidence